Hello everyone. This is December the 31st, 2010, the last day of 2010, and this is a day in the life of a Linux and free DOS user. This is going to be a good show, and I've been looking forward to doing this episode for quite a while, and um, we're going to talk about uh, mostly open source BIOS. Now, uh, to this end, the ultimate goal is to build a completely open system. And we're mostly going to talk about open source BIOSes, uh, that is the basic input-output system of a computer. Uh, but first, on a somewhat more lighthearted note, some Linux folks have put tux stickers over their Windows keys, and they also put these uh, Linux aluminum case badges on their cases and I just thought that was uh, really interesting and one person I talked to on IRC even takes this further and suggests that instead of using control keys we should use freedom keys so yeah that's uh, that's cute anyways um, now I'm going to mention some examples of BIOS open source BIOSes uh, these are historical, and then we'll move from the historical to the modern. Okay, so you can get the full uh, commented BIOS source code for the IBM AT8286. That's freely available on the internet. Um, there is uh, a cartridge for the Commodore 64. They call it the CPM version 2.2. And uh, the source code is in Z80 assembly language, and that this cartridge is basically you put it in and you get CPM or CP forward slash M, which is an, uh, another 8-bit operating system for the uh, Commodore 64. And uh, when we talk about Commodore 64, uh, there is a little historical information here. We talk about the we don't talk about BIOS. They didn't call it the BIOS. They called it the ROM kernel, kernel, and that they spelt it K-E-R-N-A-L. Okay, and we're just going to talk a little bit about historically what was happening with the uh, the, the Commodore 64 and the Commodore Amiga. Well, back then they had proprietary firmware, so your kernel or your BIOS or whatever you want to call it. Um, it was just uh, basically a binary blob and uh, you weren't allowed to look at the source code so only if you worked for Commodore uh, okay now uh, going to let's go forward a little bit into the present and what else is available <coughs> well there's the Lamote from China which has the uh, the MIPS CPU and it uses PMON as the BIOS, and that is open source, you can freely download it. Um, of course, back in, uh, meanwhile, back in x86 land, where I seem to be firmly uh, entrenched, uh, we have Core Boot, which was formerly known as Linux BIOS, and it was started back in 1999. And it is a free software project aimed at replacing the proprietary BIOS or firmware that you find in most of today's computers. It performs just a little bit of hardware initialization and it executes a payload. Uh, and in my case, I use CBIOS. And uh, you can check the website uh, coreboot.org for supported motherboards. Okay, so um, let's, let's, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, particulars. Uh, Coreboot and CBIOS are both written in C language and it was compiled with uh, GCC uh, also known as the GNU compiler collection uh, CBIOS is an open source implementation uh, of a 16-bit x86 BIOS uh, and CBIOS doesn't do any memory test you don't see a post par on system test like you would on a normal BIOS so it's a lot faster it just goes it just goes right into the uh, the startup sequence it's very fast okay besides um, x86 and x86 
64 arch architectures. Core boot also support core, core boot support also exists for the AMD. Okay, now I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Again, we're in this type of a situation. AMD uh, G Geode G E O D E. That's how I'm going to say it. Uh, G node AMD G node. Of course, this is also x86 based, so it's not really that much different. Uh, G node processors are optimized for low power consumption and low cost, while still remaining compatible with software written for the x86 platform. Okay, in um, 2006, some microsystems uh, released their open firmware implementation called uh, Open Boot under a BSL license and their uh, code supports the Sun 4V architecture running on a hypervisor. Okay, so you can see there's a few different uh, open source BIOSes out there. Uh, okay, in my specific case I use Core Boot with a gigabyte GA dash six B BXC six BXC and uh, the, this uh, motherboard has three ISA slots, four PCI slots, and one AGP slot. Uh, and maximum memory uh, it supports is seven hundred and sixty eight megs. Now note with the presence of uh, the ISA slots, it allows one to use uh, legacy sound cards like legacy uh, ISA Sound Blaster or a Jazz 16 and this is useful for compatibility with old DOS games if you want to run free DOS on let's say like a oh I don't know a Pentium 3 system. Now um, I'll just describe this motherboard in a little bit more detail. It has two 9-pin serial ports now the serial ports can be used to do diagnostics. You connect a null modem between two uh, sets of serial ports on two computers and you can get diagnostic information from your serial port by using a terminal program like uh, Minicom. Okay, and it also has a parallel port, two USB ports, and I'm pretty sure that's USB version one. And uh, yeah, if you have the null modem, nine pin null modem cable and a flash programmer, that's uh, that's really useful to have when you're doing um, when you're using core boot or you're trying to implement core boot on uh, a motherboard. Now I have successfully booted with core boot and CBIOS on this motherboard, uh, the Gigabyte one, and uh, I'll just let's just describe a little bit about how it, how it works. Core boot does a low-level initialization of the DRAM for the board, and uh, by default. Core Boot does not provide BIOS call services. So, uh, what happens is Core Boot actually uses a payload called CBIOS, and uh, that is used to provide BIOS calls and thus allows Core Boot to load operating systems that require those services. Now, with this setup, I have successfully booted with uh, my Ultimate Boot CD, which has a whole bunch of different DOS versions and uh, Linux versions, uh, like for example Tom's Root Boot. Uh, I had some trouble with the PCI network card on Tom's Root Boot. It's uh, it's an older Linux, and the IRQ on the uh, on the Ethernet card came up as zero. Uh, I also had some trouble with the Logitech wireless keyboard, and the keyboard didn't work with it at all. So uh, that was kind of. Uh, a little technical detail that I'll mention. And uh, in FreeDOS, I had to disable legacy USB in the BIOS to get it to work properly. <coughs> and I also booted successfully with uh, DSL or damn small Linux. Um, pretty much any modern Linux should boot with it. And of course, on on uh, on DSL, I had no problems with the uh, IRQ zero on the. Uh, Ethernet card, so I guess Tom Tom's root boot doesn't initialize certain things uh, automatically. So um, it's good to have a number of keyboards on hand. 
just in case CBIOS doesn't work correctly with your keyboard, and that does happen. I had some trouble with my LabTech PS2 keyboard, but then I used a different PS2 keyboard and it worked. I used uh, the i3 DVR keyboard. Uh, not sure why it worked with that one and not the LabTech, but uh, there you go. Um, pro here's the progress I've been making with the FreeDOS. Uh, I've been using my Vector Linux box uh, with FreeDOS and well let's just reiterate uh, the hardware on that. Uh, motherboard was uh, a QDI uh, P6C69 4X and now unfortunately this board isn't supported by Core Boot as yet. Uh, let's go over the particulars just briefly. One ISA slot very useful. One PG, one AGP slot, and five PCI slots. Okay, it is a VIA Technologies Incorporated um, VT82C686 AC97 audio controller with the Realtek 8139 Ethernet card. Okay, into this I added a ISA card, uh, Jazz 16. Uh, an old Jazz 16 sound card, and it's an interesting card. Um, it supports three different CD-ROM drives, uh, all from the old era, like the um, the pre uh, Atapi uh, ATAIP style CD-ROMs. So it's pr previous to that. Uh, it supported Panasonic, so something like a CR562. <coughs> Excuse me and the old Sony and the old Mitsumi. Now unfortunately I don't have any of these uh, old CD-ROM drives that still work from that time period. So we're talking around oh, 93, 1993, 1994. Um, so now uh, this box dual boots Vector Linux with KDE um, 3.5.10 and FreeDOS 1.0. The end result is uh, I have a P Pentium 3 system that I can run Linux in old MS-DOS games 100%. Uh, I actually, so I actually have two sound systems. I have the uh, the AC97 system and the Jazz 16 system on the same computer. Now I'm not using these two systems at the same time. What I'm doing is I'm unplugging from the uh, when I go from uh, Vector Linux to FreeDOS, I'm unplugging. The, uh, my headphones from the uh, AC97 audio out and I'm plugging it into the Jazz 16 audio out. And uh, I'll just remark that the Jazz 16 uh, card, the older technology, is a bit noisier. And it has the volume control uh, uh, adjuster right on the back of the card, so it's not very convenient. You actually have to go behind uh, your computer and adjust it with your finger. Uh, on the back of the card. So that's what I have to do when I'm using FreeDOS. Um, but this three, this P3 system has become my main FreeDOS system now and it's particularly useful because I wrote my fair share of uh, MS-DOS programs back in the day. So we're talking actually uh, oh, uh, pre-1990 you know, MS-DOS programs, so pretty old. Uh, EGA programs even. Now, uh, I, kinda, I, I encountered a couple of surprises while working on this project. Uh, I found out that the Logitech wireless keyboard, uh, the, it's a USB wireless keyboard, uh, works just fine under FreeDOS with this hardware. So I'm actually playing uh, old MS-DOS games using the, the modern Logitech wireless USB keyboard. Um, one little detail, the caps lock and the num lock LEDs are not on the keyboard itself. They're on the USB wireless receiver. So yeah, that takes a little bit of getting used to because you're looking at you know, whether your caps lock is on or not and uh, you can't actually tell by looking at the keyboard itself. You have to look at the little receiver uh, device. So. Um, my next project is going to be to uh, put core boot on uh, more systems and I have another motherboard which is uh, core boot compatible. It's the Asus MEW 
dash am motherboard and I'm going to put core boot and CBIOS on that. I need an adapter though so that I can uh, program the uh, the PLCC <coughs> excuse me um, the plastic leaderless chip container which has the BIOS on it and I have a, a, a top 350 uh, excuse me a top 853 USB universal programmer which isn't too expensive and you can easily get them on eBay um, one rather uh, big drawback with this setup is that I actually have to boot into Windows oh horrors and to use the top three uh, 853 uh, programmer and uh, so as a result of this I actually have to have one machine that runs I have one laptop that dual boots with uh, Fedora 10 and uh, uh, Windows XP so we'll have to do something about that for sure in the near, very near future. Uh, so anyway, it's been a very interesting project, and I'm very, very pleased with the end result. Uh, we'll wrap it up there, and thanks again for listening.